Good evening. Welcome to Subtext, locally owned independent bookstore, independent, just like Russ is independent. And um, we've been open about a year and with people's help. We're going to be here for a long time. Independent bookstores are struggling, but they're coming back now. And so we need your help. Please come back again and buy books. We'll be happy to see you whenever you come. Um, we have a large schedule of events. There's a schedule up in front, or you can sign up for our our, lit, our uh, email, and we'll send you emails about events that are coming up. Please do so. Tonight, it's my pleasure to welcome Russ Baker. Russ is an independent journalist. He um, nonpartisan, and when, when I said independent journalist and in, independent investigative journalist to my friend Mahmoud El Khati back there, we both looked at each other and said, "I F Stone." And um, Russ is in that tradition, and he um, he has his own online website, whowhatwhy.com. He's written for the New York Times, the New Yorker, Esquire, The Nation, and many other places. He's going to talk tonight about the NSA scandal, and when he's done, he'll sign copies of this book, Family of Secrets, right back over there. So um, please give a warm welcome to Russ Baker. Thank you. I've got a little bit of a scratchy throat here. I'll try to project. Uh, enough. I wanted to start by saying it is great to be here in Minneapolis. I couldn't resist doing that because because the funny thing is I, I've been in, I have to admit on, on this trip the last few days I've been in Minneapolis mostly and people said oh you're speaking great where are you speaking and when I said St. Paul boy the smile just disappeared and people said St. Paul and I said well isn't that like just seven miles over there and they said oh we never go to St. Paul <laughs> and I, I thought this was a joke but now I've had three or four different people I had one young woman who was our waitress last night and she bicycles and so on and she said she doesn't really go to St. Paul, it's something like too funky or something. And then I saw the neighborhood that she lives in and I thought, well, that looks mm -hmm. just the same. So I didn't know what she was talking about. Uh, but I, I, I always love these kind of things when you travel, you know, these, these sort of little differences that we have right within ourselves. And all I can say to St. Paul and Minneapolis is, can't we all just get along? <laughs> But actually, people are getting along. The good news is that people in this country of all different stripes are starting to realize that something is deeply amiss in this country, and they are starting to do something about it. I just want to share a couple of items with you. This is from the Oklahoma newspaper the other day, uh, sent to me uh, by my friend Phil Wilkie, one of my uh, hosts. And I also want to acknowledge Gary Severson over here, another host. And Gary put the whole thing together, if you can just uh, show your appreciation to him. <laughs> Um, and I am certainly very grateful to Subtext for putting this on. Um, if it wasn't uh, for independent bookstores, we wouldn't know a lot of the things that those of us who care to read do know. So please support them. Please patronize them. Please make sure, I guess we probably got about 20 copies of my book, Family Secrets. Please make sure there aren't any left and that they don't have to ship them back. They make good uh, uh, holiday gifts or uh, things to scare your worst enemy. Um, the Oklahoma newspaper, about 200 Democrats, Republicans and Libertarians, conservatives and liberals, hawks and doves, show their opposition to U.S. intervention in the Syrian civil war in a nonpartisan rally at the Oklahoma Capitol on Friday in Oklahoma City. That was covered by the local media there. And you see they, they sort of covered it admiringly uh, because they're surprised of this sort of show of uh, Nonpartisanship. Uh, I don't know how many of you know about that Congress voted on this surveillance business the other day. Okay, about half of you. Um, these things are not covered heavily enough. The fact of the matter is that almost half of the members of the House of Representatives voted uh, against the authorization for these uh, NSA uh, essentially wiretapping surveillance measures. 205 voted to uh, rescind those, 217 voted against. Uh, and I just want to read you briefly, again, from a news item on this. The 205 to 217 vote was far closer than expected and came after a brief but impassioned debate over citizens' right to privacy and the steps the government must take to protect national security. It was a rare instance in which a classified intelligence program was openly discussed on the House floor. And disagreements over the program led to some unusual coalitions. Conservative 
conservative Republicans leery of what they see as Obama administration abuses of power teamed up with liberal Democrats long opposed to intrusive intelligence programs. The Obama administration made common cause with the House Republican leadership to try to block it. It would have limited NSA phone surveillance to specific targets of law enforcement investigations, not broad dragnets. It was only one of a series of proposals, including restricting funds for Syrian rebels and adding congressional oversight to foreign aid to Egypt, intended to check President Obama's foreign and intelligence policies. But in the phone surveillance program, the House's right and left wings appeared to find a unifying cause. Representative Raul Labrador, Republican of Idaho, called it the Wingnut Coalition and called Mr. Amash, another Republican, the Chief Wingnut. Uh, the New York Times reports about uh, New Jersey Governor Chris Christie attacking libertarian Republicans from his own party about their naivete on national security. So you see something very interesting is going on here, that people who may be diametrically opposed to each other on other things find out that they actually share some things in common. And I think one of the reasons for this, unfortunately, is a kind of a partisan thing. Uh, there are always people who are critical of a who are Democrats who are critical of a Democrat in office, and you will always find Republicans will be critical of anything they do. Unfortunately, I think some of those critical of Obama on the Republican side would not have been critical of it, were not critical of it uh, during the Bush years. But still, you take what you can get. Uh, and uh, what's really happening in this country? Well, you, you all know about the Edward Snowden case, I take it, uh, and he is uh, somewhere still, I guess, in limbo uh, in Russia awaiting uh, whether he will receive asylum somewhere. Um, we have a number of other whistleblowers who have come to light lately. The number of different people who worked for the NSA who went public were threatened with jail time. Uh, and of course we have a number of these younger sort of hacker types. If you go to our website, who, what, why, dot org or dot com we're a nonprofit so it's dot org you can read uh, about a fellow named Barrett Brown uh, who faces up to 100 years in jail for posting some things on the internet that shouldn't even have been uh, illegal not enough people know about him in his case uh, we hope that who what why as a news source is bringing to people's attention things they might not otherwise know about um, but to get a sense of this scope of the problem in this country in terms of the secret state the threats against all of our freedom, our liberty, and our privacy, you need to know how many Americans hold top secret security clearances. Uh, would anybody like to take a guess? Three. Three, okay, any other guesses? 1.1 one million. 1.1 1 .1 million, anybody else? No. Three million. Three mil oh, we're just gonna, okay. <laughs> Two billion. No. Okay. No. There are not two billion people in this country. Okay. So uh, the answer is 1.4 million Americans have top secret clearance. There are people, there may be people in this audience who have it. If anybody works in any kind of uh, defense contracting, they call it defense, maybe offense contracting, uh, whatever you want to call it. Uh, anybody who works in any kind of a high tech business may have it. Uh, and the problem is if you have it, you can't talk. And so, can you hear me in the back? Okay. And so what we're dealing with is an entire strata of this country, some of the best educated people are silenced. And they're threatened with jail time if they talk about anything they know. So the whole question of the, um, of the um, top secret clearances is what we want to take a look at. These are the kinds of things we should be looking at. What is top secret clearance? What does that mean? Uh, and what happens if you have top secret clearance and you discover that elements within your own government are basically betraying the American people. What would you do about it? And these conversations don't take place. And one of the reasons they don't take place is because the only uh, entity that can really regulate any of this is, is Congress. And only members of Congress who are supposedly given access to any of this are people who are put onto the intelligence committees. And when you join the intelligence committee, guess what they tell you? You can't talk about it. So it's a pretty bad situation. And again, we need to rethink these things. These people have to be able to talk about it. Also, they have to know something about what they're doing. Some of them are pretty clueless. And to make matters worse, their staffs, I don't know if you know this, but this was documented a number of years ago when they created the Senate and House Intelligence Committees. The intelligence agencies immediately said, well, you know, this is complex material. It may be hard for you to understand. We can recommend some people to you who you may want to use as your staffers. And you can guess where that went. Um, there's a long history 
of surveillance. If you go all the way back to the 1920s, there was something called the Black Chamber, and they were uh, they went over to Western Union and made a deal with the uh, head of Western Union. They'd be able to read all of the telegrams. Uh, so this has been going on for a long time. I won't bore you with the whole history, but basically what happened was in the 1970s, uh, I mean, there were laws in place for restrictions in the 1970s, uh, the, the Church Committee, a very important thing to read about, Frank Church's uh, special select committee, uh, which is the only committee really in, in, in recent history in this country that has seriously challenged this national security set as to who they are, who appointed them, what they do, and whether this is in our interests. Uh, uh, they uh, discovered the extent to which the American people were being spied upon, and uh, we, the result was we had something called FISA, uh, and that uh, is a um, an act that is supposed to limit uh, the spying, and basically the bottom line is that they're supposed to go to judges. Uh, national Security Court judges and make a case and say we need to spy on this couple because of XYZ. Now as it happens the judges uh, uh, say yes essentially 100% of the time so I don't know what kind of a uh, of a check that is but it's better than nothing. Now under George Bush he decided he didn't even want to wait the couple of days it would take for a judge to make a ruling and they decided to just go ahead without the judges a kind of an incredible thing and when Congress found out instead of uh, penalizing them for that they authorized it uh, and so now we are in a particular moment where finally there's a possibility uh, of getting a lid on some of this um, by the way, at the end, we'll do a question and answer and take all of your questions. If you have a point of clarification that's absolutely urgent, let me know. But no, no speeches until later, and preferably not at all. <laughs> okay. Um, ex that's my friend Dick Bancroft. Anybody know him? He's a fabulous photographer. He had his own reading here, a, a documenter of the American Indian Movement. And Dick and I met, and uh, we were roommates in uh, Managua, Nicaragua in 1986. I haven't seen him since then, and we just got together the other day, and he's just the same with the same kind of jokes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, so um, the U.S., I don't know if you know this, they were bugging the EU. The European Union, our allies, they were bugging ally embassies. They were trying to find out whether they were going to go along with the invasion of Iraq. Um, and then they've been working with the UK, the only one that they maybe didn't bug, but we think they probably bugged them too, for these continental taps. And what they were doing was uh, wherever they want to be able to say that we are not uh, listening to Americans, they ask the cousins to listen to the Americans and then give them the material. So they've got every trick in the book going. 60% uh, of intelligence is subcontracted now. 60% of all this stuff goes out to private companies. I think, isn't Honeywell here? Used to be. Used to be here. Okay, I don't know. They may not even be a bit. They all change their names. I can't even keep track. But these big companies, Boeing or what have you, they all get these kind of contracts. And so, essentially, instead of these government people, it's your neighbor, the one with the top secret clearance, who may be uh, spying on you. Um, so, uh, and I just saw this, that, that, and this got no attention at all, the NSA uh, said that they only look at specific suspects, and then they had to admit later that they looked at suspects in what they called one hop away, which was anybody who was, you know, maybe called them, and then they later admitted that they went two hops away, and guess what? They just admitted, they let it slip accidentally, that they now go three hops away. To get this in perspective, you should know that a recent European study shows that thanks to the internet, we are all 4.74 hops away. Uh, and then, to give you an idea of the mindset of this, they quote this one official, Mr. Inglis, and it says, Inglis's admission isn't likely to help the effort to convince members of the House that the surveillance program should be kept as is. Neither will a response offered by uh, the uh, Office of National Intelligence Counsel, Robert Litt, asked by Committee Chairman Bob Goodlatte if the government really thought the massive collection of phone records could be kept from the American people. Litt replied, well, um... We tried. Okay. I won't bore you with any more of this stuff. There's a lot going on. We need to pay attention to this. Uh, we need to be concerned about the uh, efficacy of the elected officials. Um, 
Many of the best ones who did the work on these things are no longer around, no longer in Congress. Some of them met tragic ends, as you know, here in Minnesota with Paul Wellstone. A lot of the, the handful of people who really speak out on these things, they get targeted for defeat or what have you, and I don't think it's all a coincidence. Uh, privacy. So we are told uh, that we need to give up our privacy. You you've all heard this during the 9-11 period, right? You need to give up your privacy because this is for your safety. Your safety depends on your giving up your privacy. I would say your safety depends on your having some privacy. Um, but polls keep going up and back. Some of them show that people are concerned, but a lot of people say, hey, you know what? Honey, do we need privacy? I mean, they say there are bad guys out there, so okay, let's do it. Um, but I know I worry all the time uh, about this. I get stopped at airports. I've been stopped a couple of times at Kennedy Airport, and they asked me, they said, come with me. You know, and that's kind of chilling when somebody says, would you come with me, please? Uh, ask anybody at Guantanamo who have been there for 10 years, never charged, many of them never did anything. Um, yeah, and eventually they'd let me go and they'd say, they wouldn't tell you what it was. It was interesting, they don't have to tell you why they took you. One guy told me, uh, he, I guess he took pity on me and he indicated that there had been some kind of mistaken identity and I took that to mean that they found somebody named Ras Al Abu Bakr and that's who they were looking for. <laughs> Uh, but it is, it is guilt by association, a lot of this stuff. Um, obviously, if you're active at all, if you're concerned about Guantanamo, potentially you are a terrorist sympathizer. If you're concerned about any of these people, if you feel anybody has been railroaded and law enforcement has already declared them to be problems, then you're a problem. So you see that this thing can really, really grow and really fester. Um, but we see these kinds of problems all over the place where people who may not fit the mainstream, who may be guilty of independent thinking and inquiry, uh, are considered a problem, which, which raises the question, what constitutes a troublemaker? What is a troublemaker? And is a troublemaker somebody who should be penalized or put in jail? Um, Certainly, if you go back to, in the American history, the same people that all these people who love all these repressive measures tout are these people like Tom Paine. You notice that? They're all there waving their flags on the 4th of July, and they liked all these rebels back then, but they sure don't like them now. Uh, and then a guy like Snowden, and they make him the target. And then, you know, you, if you see our website, you know, the picture of the girlfriend, the pole dancer, and they all wanted to focus on that. And people like George Stephanopoulos giving his guests a hard time and saying, well, don't you think, you, you know, trying to make them feel guilty, whether it's Julian Assange or civil liberties lawyers, that they're doing something wrong, putting them on the defensive. Um, some of the other stories are connected and go deeper. The, uh, the Occupy story, how many of you read that story on our website about the targeting of the Occupy leaders? Yeah. Okay, a few of you. Uh, we obtained and published uh, FBI documents showing that uh, there had been a plot to assassinate the leaders of the Occupy movement in a number of cities. And these are FBI documents, they blocked out things, but they left the parts where you can see that the people were going to use high-powered rifles in Houston and several other cities to target them. And we don't know what, if anything, the FBI did about this. There's no indication they took any action. And if any of you are familiar with COINTELPRO and the FBI's tar targeting of Martin Luther King and other African-American leaders, uh, you know that uh, it's not clear what role they take in these kinds of things. And then it goes deeper still, Boston. Boston, the Boston Marathon bombing. We don't have time to get into all these things. I hope you'll visit our website, whowhatwhy.org. Type in Boston in the search box and read the stories we've done. We are almost alone in news organizations in this country and in the world in asking questions about those bombings, just simply based on empirical things. For example, uh, the FBI put up those videos and said, can anybody tell us who those guys are? And you know who answered them? The FBI. Russia. Russia said, we can answer because we said they were terrorists and we told the FBI. <laughs> and then the mother of these ones said, yes, and the FBI knew who they were because they were at our house a whole bunch of times over the course of years, in and out of our house. So the FBI lied, pretended they didn't know who they were, they knew who they were, and they knew them personally. And so that raises a question, what else are they not telling us? 
So a lot of these stories uh, are, are connected. Uh, the disclosures, more democracy or more repression, uh, the effect of these kinds of things. I don't know if you know, but uh, they always talk about how endangered we are, but there have been almost no terrorist plots in this country since 2001. Uh, foiled ones, uh, non-foiled ones, they just almost don't exist. And as horrific, and I live in New York City, and I was there when the Building 7 collapsed. I was standing right in front of it. I, I covered that, and I, you know, it, it traumatized me, of course. But you know, statistically, I mean, if you take the risks of texting when you cross the street, you know, it's much, much higher than that you will ever be hit by any of these things, even if there are no security measures in place, even if they didn't have uh, uh, the metal detectors and the pat-downs and all that stuff. The statistics are that basically we would be extremely safe in almost all conditions. It's mostly psychological. The fear is psychological. Uh, and so... Um, so we have to decide, do we want to encrypt? Have any of you been thinking about that? Do I want to encrypt my emails? Do I want to, yeah, yeah, okay. Well, you know, and so I've been talking to these people, but you see, then I t some people tell me, yes, you should get these programs and, that encrypt, and then other people tell me, no, no, those are the ones that the NSA is in first, you know, <laughs> or they're in league with the people who are encrypting, you know, so what's the point? Um, so... Really, I think what we have to ask ourselves, and this is where you start becoming unpopular and labeled a troublemaker, is how much of the danger caused to us is caused by these unknown foreign people, and how much of it is caused by our own government's policies? Because at a minimum, we know that there are people all over the world who have had family members killed by drones and things like that who are justifiably pretty angry or have relatives at Guantanamo who were just swept up by accident. Wrong place at the wrong time. Uh, how about the stoking of plots? You know about this? The FBI likes to have a very high, you know, they say they always get their man. The reason they always get their man is they always know who the man is beforehand uh, or they get some man. <laughs> And so this is why we have things like the Innocence Project, where there are loads of people, largely African-American males, though not exclusively, who it turns out didn't do it and who are in jail. And so police departments and uh, uh, agencies like the FBI maintain these impossibly high uh, uh, capture, uh, prosecution, uh, conviction rates uh, by playing some games. And one of the games, of course, is to have lots of informants. And the informants don't really have anything to do unless they have something to inform on. And so what they're supposed to do is try to find somebody who wants to commit a crime. So many of these things, like the, there was an earlier bombing of the World Trade Center in 1993 that I also covered. And that one was the, the guy himself, the informant, is on tape saying, well, hey, you guys, you FBI guys were the ones who made the whole thing happen with the bomb. You know, you, you know they, were, they were encouraging them to make the bombs. And so we think that if we keep reporting on this Boston story, we may find something like that. It may turn out to be a lot more complicated. And we already know, I don't know if anybody's heard this, that they were doing uh, drills. Do you know they were planning drills in advance of that? And they were going to have drills with bombs and backpacks? I mean, hello, don't you think the media ought to at least look into some of this stuff? Well, they don't do that. Uh, FBI cover-ups. Whitey Bulger, have you heard of him? The, uh, the, the, the mob guy who bragged he killed at least 40 people and he was being protected by the FBI because he was working with them on some other things. This is a complicated mess. It really, really is complicated. And you'd say, hey, this is, this is fodder for an elected official, right? Somebody could call a commission. I mean, you go back 50 or 80 years ago, there were all these commissions that looked into things, but they don't really exist anymore. And when we have commissions like the 9-11 Commission, they themselves complain that they're not able to get material. And then as the 9-11 Commission said, what they did report, do you know that? All the Saudi connection stuff, 80 pages was blocked out before they could release that. So we have a serious problem here. And we have to ask ourselves not just the nature of these things, but actually about the nature of the state itself. We, it's time to start asking ourselves, what is our country? What actually is it? And, you know, we're always told we're all in this together, right? We go to the football games. I don't know if you've traveled to other countries. There are very few countries that make you do as much flag-waving, anthems, <laughs> saluting, uh, talk about our boys who are fighting for you, and so forth. There's no analysis of what any of this is. And, and Americans are basically the mo some of the most propagandized people in the world. We do these things reflexively. If you talk about them, your neighbors become very angry at you, but they don't know why they're angry. 
This is very <laughs> deeply programmed stuff. And uh, then we're told we're all in it together, except when your neighbor says, you get near my fence and I'll shoot you, right? And then you say, well, maybe we're not all in this together. I mean, there are a lot of people, road rage, and people who say, I hope you burn in hell and whatever else. I mean, life is more complicated. And as you know, when you travel, it's like somebody like Dick Bancroft goes to all these countries, and you meet lovely people everywhere. And you say, well, these people are just like me, and I get along with them, and we even like you know, similar foods and movies and stuff, and then my neighbor and I don't agree on anything. So this, this, this bifurcation where it's all of us against all of them is kind of sick, actually, if you think about it. And, and, and then you look at our country and you say, you know what, there's so much going on in this country where it is us versus them right in this country. Where greedy interests, they t say here in Minnesota, the, the, the threat of the privatization of water and then shipping it uh, out uh, uh, without any kind of accountability. Of course, the pollution, uh, these big companies dumping their stuff into, you know all about this, it's been going on here for a long time. Uh, climate change, all of these issues are really a sort of an us versus them right here and that is what we're not supposed to be talking about. And we're not supposed to ask what is national security? What is national security? Maybe you can tell me because I don't actually know. I'm not really sure what it is. I do know I need to look at what time it is because I, I can talk a lot and I don't want to bore you. If you get bored, by the way, seriously, just indicate and I will stop. <laughs> it's not or not off. Okay. Uh, national security. I, I always bring a few notes and then I just say whatever comes to mind, which I always figure is more interesting, at least to me, because I never know what I'm going to say. Uh, national security, what is national security? I have no idea. Cyber spying, they spy on our allies. Oh, here's another one. The Chinese, have you heard this? The Chinese are spying on us. The Chinese are breaking into our computers, right? I mean, our computers are made by the Chinese. <laughs> Americans invest. I meet all these Republicans and they always tell me I'm off to Beijing and I say, what are you doing there? And they say, oh, I got a company there. You know, the same people who are telling us that the Chinese are breaking into our computers are over there owning those companies or investing in them or whatever it is, having them make stuff for the American uh, companies. And then, of course, you know, um, uh, thanks to uh, Mr. Snowden, we know that the U.S. is breaking into the Chinese computers. He was the first, that's maybe why they're after him for saying that. How dare he reveal that? And then I saw, did you hear this? The Americans, you know, complaining about the Russians, right? You know, Cold War's over. Everybody remember the peace dividend? That was under Clinton. There was going to be a peace dividend after the end of the Cold War. Uh, end of history, as that, that dude said, remember? The end of history and everything. And now there are no more enemies. Uh, flowers will sprout everywhere and we will all sing fa-la-la and so forth. And there would be a peace dividend. Tremendous amounts of money that would fix all those potholes and uh, suddenly everybody would be lifted out of poverty and somehow they never got around to it because of these new threats appeared and they were bigger threats than the old threats now it's people everywhere now you don't even know who they are so you not only need the same giant foreign defense establishment you need a huge domestic homeland security you know you need everybody spying on everybody it goes it's like going back to the days of the red scare in the 1920s you know so it's all kinds of people. And guess what? On top of everything else, the Russians, they tell us, are still bad. So in addition to all the new enemies, we, but of course we're doing business with the Russians, and guess where the U.S. government did? They just bought, they just ordered, I read somewhere, 120, whatever it is, you know, Chinook, I don't know what they're, Chinook maybe, or, you know, uh, attack helicopters from the Russians. Sikorsky probably, but whatever it is, they, 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 they're buying weapons for war from our enemies. Okay, so probably an American plant over there or something. You know, this is, this is the multinational thing. And then there's Arab Spring. And so when we first heard about Arab, Arab Spring, everybody was excited, right? We said, isn't this terrific? Arab Spring, democracy in these countries that never had democracy. When we saw it with Egypt, we said that was terrific. We got so excited. We said, maybe they'll even do that here. And then we thought, oh, no, that's really ridiculous, so come on. So we realized you couldn't get the people to go into the streets here for anything, uh, you know, unless their big gulps were withheld or something, you know. But uh, so a few people did, but not many. It was very few people. But not many statistically. It was very few people. In those countries, you're talking about really a percentage, a significant percentage of the population. Um, and so, and so, um, 
we started taking a look at these other Arab Springs. You, you know, the, the U.S., of course, didn't support the Egyptian Arab Spring, but when there was one in Libya, they were just so gung-ho about it. And at who, what, why, we began saying why. Why is Hillary Clinton and all these generals and everybody so excited about the Libyan Arab Spring, but not the Egyptian one? And we started looking into it. How many of you read our articles? Very few of you. Okay, I hope you will uh, after this, because uh, uh, Bill Moyers, among other people, said that he got the best information on what was really happening in Libya from who, what, why, could not find it anywhere else in the world. We began digging into it, and basically what we found was the, that the Libyan uprising, not to say that the Libyan people weren't oppressed and that there weren't problems there, but that the Libyan uprising involved the fact that Muammar Gaddafi was uncontrollable and that there were a lot of different issues going on, I won't go into them here, where they decided that they could flip the Arab Spring, get their own uprising, remove Gaddafi and put their people in power. This was engineered initially by the French intelligence service with the collaboration of American and British intelligence service. Uh, and of course the people who went in the streets probably had no idea because with the, you get a, you get a, a Twitter thing, you, you know, you go, right? You, know, you don't know what, what's behind that. We found the same thing in Syria. And as much as we feel the Syrian people are oppressed, they're not really any more oppressed than people in any of those authoritarian countries over there that, that our country has always backed. And it was the same thing. This was a, this was a non-aligned leader and there were a lot of issues with pipelines and his alliances with Iran and so forth. One thing you can be sure of, when your country tells you that it is doing something for benevolent reasons and humanitarian reasons abroad, Something is wrong. I'm sorry to say that. And my dear friends, all the wonderful liberals, they get really mad at me. They're still wearing their Obama buttons, you know. But, you know, I'm sorry. That's not the way these things work. And you know something? If you were the National Security Advisor, you wouldn't be saying, let's go into Afghanistan for women's rights, because that's not your job. Your job is to figure out what is, na you know what national security is? It's keeping these lights on keeping the heat on, the air conditioning, keeping fuel going, and they, I think, justifiably view their job that way, but they can't talk about it. The president can't say, hey, listen, we got a problem here. I got a secret report, and I'm told we need to go into that country and grab their minds, because we don't have the stuff to make any more iPhones. As the trend about national security. Yeah. yeah. So, um, so who's in charge? Who's in charge? Who runs the country? Uh, my book, Family of Secrets. Yeah. Thank you. That's what I meant to say. Who profits from this? This is my speech writer here. Thank you. Uh, who profits from all this? Um, and that's the same companies we've been talking about, obviously. It's business. Uh, and, and, so, and so that raises the question then of uh, if certain people benefit from this and other people don't, if this doesn't benefit the majority of us, how does this all work? And my book, Family of Secrets, I began looking at the Bush family because I was so astounded by George W. Bush. And if you look at the, you know, they used to have those trading cards, all the American presidents, and they even had like the worst ones in there. They had like Millard Fillmore, you know, and each of them, you'd flip it over on the back and it would have their proudest accomplishments. And each one said something, you know, obscure. And then Millard Fillmore had said, clipper ships sailed the seas. And I thought, well, that's not even about Millard Fillmore. That's how bad he was. So, but what would George Bush's, you know, card say? And, and, and so... Uh, I, I thought, how do we get people like that? I mean, even the people who voted for him really are not that f crazy about him. And, and, and so I thought, well, how did he become uh, leaders? How, you know, how does this happen? And we don't know anything about this. We don't know how Barack Obama became president because six years before, he was a, he was a Illinois state, not, not federal, state legislator. He was one of, you know, whatever, you know, 120 people in the Illinois legislature. And six years later, he's deciding uh, who will be killed by drones. And you have to say, what's the logic process there? I mean, are they putting people in who have uh, a, a broad perspective on things? I mean, there are, there are thousands of people in this country who would make better presidents than any of these people. People who, who run large NGOs, maybe right here in town, who've dealt with complex planning issues and so forth. Those people are never even considered. And so, in Family of Secrets, I try to figure out how he got to the top because there were all these other Republicans, more respectable ones they could have chosen, but all the heavy money went on him. And what the answer turned out to be, it had to do with his father. 
They were both George Bush. The father had been vice president and president before him. The father had been CIA di director for one year, which I didn't take to be that significant because one year is not that long. But I then became interested in the father and I started thinking about how did the father become a president and vice president. And I went around the country and I asked people, what can you tell me about this? And nobody had the answer and nobody thought that was an interesting question. I would talk to journalists and academics and people who knew them and they'd say, oh, I don't know. You know, they spent money. I don't know. Who cares? Who cares? Mm -hmm. Okay. So I kept looking, and the answer was the son was elected because the same people who liked his father. Now, who were the people who liked the father? They were the same people who liked the grandfather. Who was the grandfather? He was a U.S. senator, and he was with a, a major private investment banking firm that were basically on the ground floor of the creation of the American national security state. And they had dealings all over the world. Uh, you, some of you may know about this with uh, the financiers of the Nazis. Uh, they, it was all business, you know, these, these outfits, it's all business. Business. And so they were in World War I, uh, ancestors of the Bushes involved with Remington Arms, and they were selling rifles to both sides. And on top of selling rifles to both sides, they pushed a reluctant President Wilson, who didn't want to get involved, to get into the war because we were going to get our spoils. And one of the people involved with the, uh, uh, with the, um, uh, with the, uh, the, the post-war conference uh, uh, was a young man named Alan Dulles, who was there pushing for the United States. He, Wilson was a nice enough guy, and he wasn't comfortable with this. And there was Alan Dulles pushing that the United States needed to get in there and, and grab uh, what it could uh, at the Versailles uh, conference. And so uh, Alan Dulles, in the 1950s, Truman gets elected. Alan Dulles becomes the head of the new, you know, relatively new CIA. Uh, his brother is the Secretary uh, of State. And uh, Senator Prescott Bush is on a thing called the Psychological Strategy Board, which is supposed to be thinking about what everybody in the United States knows and understands and how to craft a message. And this message crafting, this is what really, really has us uh, in the dark. And that is uh, really where my focus is. It's about um, the nature of what we know and what we don't know, the nature of the media. Um, uh, I, I bring you the bad news that the media is bad. And, um, okay, I, I'm going to do this quickly. I do want to start reading you something I just read, which I thought was astonishing. Uh, this is uh, at a, a, a security forum at the Aspen Institute. Now, did you ever wonder what all these outfits are? The Brookings, the Aspen, the this, the that, the American uh, Enterprise Institute. And who pays for these fancy places? You know, you see them on TV. Here we are on CNN with this scholar from the so-and-so institute. But nobody says, who pays for that guy? I mean, nobody pays for us. You know, we're struggling. And they all got just oodles of money. Okay. Seated on a stool before an audience packed with spooks, lawmakers, lawyers, and mercenaries, CNN's Wolf Blitzer introduced recently retired CENTCOM Chief General James Mattis. Quote, I've worked with him and I've worked with his predecessors, Blitzer said of Mattis. I know how hard it is to run an operation like this. This is a journalist. <laughs> Reminding the crowd that CENTCOM is, quote, really, really important. Blitzer urged them to celebrate Mattis. Let's give the general a round of applause. Following the gales of cheering that resounded from the room, Mattis, the gruff 40-year Marine veteran who once volunteers his opinion that, quote, it's fun to shoot some people, <laughs> outlined the challenge ahead. The war on terror that began on 9-11 has no discernible end, he said, likening it to the, quote, constant skirmishing between the U.S. Cavalry and the Indians during the genocidal, he didn't use that term, Indian Wars of the 19th century. Quote, the skirmishing will go on likely for a generation, Mattis declared. And then it goes on and on about all these people who were there and how happy everybody was with all of this. Okay, so we've got a real problem with our media. And that is why uh, I started something called Who, What, Why. We are a nonprofit, uh, and we don't take any ads. So you say, well, then how could you do anything? Well, this is where the problem comes in. We, we rely on regular people because I can tell you that the folks who give money to the Aspen Institute are not going to be writing us checks. We really need a lot of people to get behind us and to help us create a kind of a people's media. Um, 
we think this is important because there really is almost no accountability anywhere and people don't know what's going on and as I say even the liberals you know the people who mean well and drive the Prius and have the you know the, the, the they're doing their composting and they're drinking you know uh, uh, with the coffee you know the fair trade coffee you know I mean that's all great you know but you could do all of that up the wazoo and you're still going to have huge problems. You've got to pay attention to the big picture and you can't be in bed with a political party or in love with the mistake you made four or eight years ago or anything like that. But people defend themselves. They protect themselves. Um, there's probably some people here going, eh, that's me you're talking about. You know, but that's the way it is. And, and oh, that's what Walter Cronkite used to say, right? And, and that's what we need to be. We need to be what people think Walter Cronkite was. You know, we need to be providing information where we don't really have a dog in the fight. We're not saying you shouldn't have protection. I mean, gosh, I, you know, if, if, if somebody steals my car, I mean, I want a cop to, to be involved. If, if, if there is a, is a threat to me, I want security. But we want this done intelligently uh, and with, uh, with some fair, fairness. Uh, uh, we want it to be equitable and we want it to be uh, real. Um, and, and so we're, we don't have to apologize. We're no less patriots than anybody else is. And I think that's another thing, all this twisting to make it seem like uh, only certain people care about their country and the other people don't. This is, the media perpetuates this. You know, you watch these, these shows with the wars and, you know, they have the music and the flags. That is completely inappropriate, folks. I can tell you, I went to journalism school. You're not supposed to say, we, how are our boys doing? You're not supposed to do that. When you're reporting, you're supposed to be reporting the facts and that's it. So uh, we've started this thing up. Um, we believe that um, the public is being deliberately and constantly manipulated. We don't think this is an accident. The stuff that fills your brain up, we don't think that's an accident. Uh, most Americans, if you, if you were to graph how they spend their time, uh, uh, we spend most of our time working. Uh, we spend uh, a comparable amount of time, if we're lucky, sleeping. Uh, and then we have less other time. We spend time with our families, we spend time on basic things with our vehicle and our house and all the kinds of things you have to do, uh, uh, health uh, issues, and then what else is left? A tiny sliver of time to think, to read, to educate ourselves to be uh, active citizens. And the problem is we have very limited bandwidth. Now if they can fin fill up the bandwidth with junk we have completely abdicated our democracy. And whatever you may think of it, I, you know, sports is a lovely thing in some ways, but I read some statistic, the average American male, that some hundreds of hours a year that they watch sports. Uh, uh, religion, of course, and, 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 and gossip, and uh, celebrities. And, uh, of course, we like to, we want escapism, so then we escape and we read novels and whatever. It's all fine, but it crowds out the time. And at the end, and then we're busy, you know, paying attention to the important civic issues like Anthony's wiener. <laughs> So, you know, so then you say, well, what's left? Once you get it past Anthony's wiener, do we have time for Congress doing all this stuff, you know? And the answer is no. And then people go, hey, you know, I got to go. I got to go. I'm late. You know, I'm, uh, I'm late for brunch. You know, I got to go. And I get this. You know, I'm meeting with people trying to get them to write a check to us or something. And then they literally say something like, you know, or, you know, you know I, I promised I'd go bowling, you know. And I, I understand they want to go bowling, you know. But sometimes you, you got to worry about the state of of whether this, this country and this world is gonna, are going to survive. And it's all of us, actually. We can't pass the buck to anybody else. I'm willing, and my associate Carrie here in the green dress who has some clipboards here, I hope she'll pass around if you want to sign up for our mailing list and goes right into the NSA. Uh, um, uh, please print neatly, because we often can't read people's email addresses. Uh, if you'd like to be involved, you don't have to be a journalist to help turn the world around. Uh, the main thing is we think that if the public gets the information, gets good information and gets it, that things can change. And this is this stuff about the people out in the streets now in Oklahoma of all places and so on. There's a moment right now, and I can tell you I can feel it. There is a moment right now. This is a rare opening. This is, you know, this is glass-nosed perestroika. You know, this is our moment. And it, it's a real moment. And they're scared of us. You know, the bad guys are scared of us. The people in Congress sense. And remember when Obama said, make me do it? 
I think he meant that because they must have read, they must have shown him the Zapruder film early on, you know, because he got the message real quick of what he could and could not do. And you can argue as much as you want whether you like him or you don't like him, but he's irrelevant. He's irrelevant. They picked those guys as actors, you know, and Hillary's irrelevant. And if you have friends who are all excited, boy, when she becomes president, it's nothing. It is something. You get a black man or a woman, but they're only the ones that are acceptable. Next, you'll have a gay president, and then you'll have a something else, you know, and, you know, uh, somebody who composts, you know. But that's, they're doing that because they know that the public has such a low standard of what they care about that they just throw them a little bone. I talked to a very intelligent woman the other day. You know, she said to me, yeah, I like Obama. Obama. She, she, I was telling her this stuff, and she said, but I like Obama. She said, you know, I really like his wife. <laughs> I mean, well, great. What, do you hang out with her? I mean, you know, what does this have to do with anything? So anyway, at Who, What, Why, please sign up. Uh, if you care about what we do, there are a number of ways you can help. I will not beat around the bush. We operate on next to nothing, but we do have to operate. We pay really good reporters to work for very, very little. They sacrifice. If you can donate, uh, you can write checks. I think Carrie has some cards for credit card numbers and things. You can also do it on the website. Please consider being a substantial sustainer as much as you can. If any, usually the people who come to these talks are uh, as poor as I am, so I assume that's most of you, but if you know somebody who has some money, has been fortunate, or you know people who know people, or you know people who know people who know people, please come up and talk to Carrie. We're here for a couple more days. We'd love to meet with them. Uh, there are a lot of interesting folks out there. I just had lunch with uh, Jesse Ventura, uh, who you can say what you want about him, but he gets this stuff, I'll tell you. He's, he really gets this stuff. He's, he really does, uh, although he did say he preferred many. Minneapolis, but anyway, uh, so uh, he grew up in he grew up in Minneapolis. So anyway, uh, please be involved. Now there are other ways you can be involved. If all you do, I call it a, a pajama cowboy. All you do is you get up in the morning. You don't even have to get dressed. Sit down at your computer. You see a story on our website forward it to all these other people say this is a great website you got to take a look at this this has changed my understanding whatever you want to say share it because every one of you if you do that to 10 people and they do it five more and so on this stuff spreads and pretty soon you got something going on you can also help in other ways we need help uh, from uh, uh, people who uh, uh, have some skills uh, Tamara are you here somewhere yeah. Tamara okay uh, okay uh, so, so you know volunteers who who uh, who, who help out, uh, you know, who have jobs or whatever they do, but they help out uh, with skill sets that they have. And we need people who can do PR and photography and art design and programming and uh, put on events. You know, maybe w one of you can put on an event in, God forsake, Minneapolis or, you know, another town. Or maybe you can put on events at your house and get... Uh, 30 people there for brunch or something. Um, we really need help because we're a movement. We're like an old-fashioned political campaign. We'll do the specialty journalism, but uh, all that other stuff, we really need people to be involved. So anyway, I won't go on and on. I know we want to get to some questions. Uh, let me uh, uh, wrap up uh, by saying that if, 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 oh, the other thing I wanted to mention is that it's not just about the media covering depressing things. We also cover non-depressing things. We cover good things, good ideas, inventions, solutions. That's another thing the media doesn't cover. They cover neither the good ideas nor the bad things that's going on. You say, well, what do they do? But they find something else and they fill it up. It's amazing. Um, and so, and so we, you know, if the media covered good people and good ideas, good ideas and good people would have a chance because people would know about them. And everybody says to me, hey, how come I haven't heard of you? You seem pretty articulate. How come you don't have your own TV show? Why aren't you on Jon Stewart? Why aren't you on Amy Goodman or whatever? Why aren't you on, you know, we're not on any of those shows. And those, you know, they're, they're good, but they're all tied in with corporate stuff. They all get money from foundations and everything else. And, you know, my, one of my favorite new sayings is, if you've heard of it, it probably ain't too good because you only hear about the things that are sponsored. And we've got to create our own sort of, you know, underground telegraph to have another way to communicate information to people. So we want to create interest. We want to harness energy. We're going to have a Q&A afterwards. Uh, what we're doing at Who, What, Why is we're, we're building a better country and a better world, one disclosure at a time. Thank you. I'm going to repeat the questions. Please don't make speeches. Just ask a question and keep it to one sentence. Yes, ma'am. Okay. One thing you didn't mention, and what I'm wondering, and who, what, why, can 
we share with you what might not be known? Okay, question is, can, can you share your information with us? Absolutely. Uh, we have a spot on the site where you can contact us. Uh, we get a lot of people contacting us. It's, it, we're small. We have a limited ability to even read those things. Particularly if you have inside information, those are the things that are going to get the most attention. If you're a whistleblower, if you have real documents, and you can write a short email that gets right to the point in the first sentence or paragraph, we would be uh, very, very appreciative. Uh, yes, sir, back there. Uh, uh, about, I think it was about three years ago or so that Blackwater changed its name to Blackwater Z. And it's, you know, it is a standing army on our, in our own land, a private contractor. Uh, and it just kind of at least for me, it just kind of disappeared, it just kind of dropped again below the radar screen, except for the Iraq. Question is... Can you tell more about what's happening with Blackwater? Okay, well, see, this is part of the problem, because the liberal media wants you to think that Blackwater is what you should focus on, but it's not. It's just a company. There are hundreds, and have always been hundreds of these outfits. They're all over this city, you know that? There are these, these private outfits, you go in there, and the secretary is shocked that you walked in the door, because they never have any customers, because they're fronts for these other things. Blackwater is no different than all of these others. It's still around. It changed its name again. Once everybody figured out it was called XE, it changed its name again to something else. Academy. Academy, a, a, with an I at the end. So these entities are everywhere. We need to understand the extent to which uh, our tax dollars are, that was the other great thing, the great theft under Reagan was to, to, to steal all the tax dollars and shove it out to, uh, to their cronies. So, so that's, that's a very, very important issue. Yes, ma'am. Do you think Michael Hastings was killed by the government? The question is about Michael Hastings, the uh, Rolling Stone reporter who died in a one-car crash when his car accelerated and went right into a tree. Uh, we uh, uh, were one of the few news sites that wrote about that. We also have posted uh, yesterday, it's up on our site, uh, video from a camera that actually shows the crash. Um, uh, we will continue to look at it. We don't know because we try to be agnostic about everything until we can get more information because, again, the problem on the Internet is there's sort of two uh, sectors to the so-called media. There are those who jump to conclusions that nothing happened and there are those who jump to conclusions that something happened. And we just don't jump to conclusions, but we're going to keep looking at it. We do have a story I think will be up uh, within the next week about what he was working on that may shed some light on that. Yes, sir. You mentioned earlier the Heritage Foundation, the American Enterprise Institute, of those and others of their ilk, who would you say is the one, in spite of their fund funding by billions of Cokes and other, other sources, what would be a good target for us to be active against? To folks, and the question was, of all these big sort of think tanks that we really don't understand who's behind them, what would be one to sort of focus uh, as a, uh, on as a target? Uh, that's a good question. I'm going to take that under submission as a possible uh, either a story for us uh, or a series of stories. Feel free to suggest things like that. We're very open to input. And by the way, uh, and I don't want to, there's no quid pro quos here, but if somebody says, hey, you know, I sure would love to see some journalists who cover climate change on a regular basis, would you start a climate team? If they were able to write us a check, then we would hire some reporters and get on it right away. Uh, let's see. Uh, yes, ma'am. What about the Trans-Pacific Partnership? Have you gotten into that? Uh, we have not gotten into the Trans-Pacific Partnership. There are all these endless globe girdling uh, variations on you know NAFTA and what have you that are are schemes by these multinational uh, outfits to further multinationalize everything and 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 uh, uh, and, and, and diminish our own laws and regulations to, to protect us but that's another one we ought to look in there has been some writing on it um, we are always looking for a new angle we want to be able to, to one of the reasons our work is so difficult is this it's all original. We don't do derivative stuff, and we don't just publish opinion pieces. We actually do do, do some research on it. Sir, back way in the back. Yeah, you, you, you know, the glasses. Where do you get your own information other than your own reporting? Other than my own reporting, where do I get my information? Well, people always say, what do you like to read? I said, if I had something I like to read, I wouldn't have started Who, What, Why. <laughs> um, 
I read a variety of things. The things I was just reading you from are from all over the place. I use my email as my clipping service. People read things and send them to me and it's kind of like you know the president having advisors except mine aren't all in the tank. There are people who really see things and send them to me. That's how I actually do most of my reading. I do start the day skimming the New York Times. I used to spend hours on it. Now I spend about 10 minutes which is all that I need. Uh, but I go to a variety of things. One of the things we'd like to do at Huawei eventually is to consider maybe having a page where we select certain things from around the world that we think are the best pieces for other people to read. Again, we'd like to do that. We need to hire somebody and pay them to, who's an experienced person to edit all that. So that's, that's a challenge. Yes, ma'am. Well, another thing Sorry. that I would say uh, along those lines is that your Twitter feed is very good at that. So um, when you follow Who, What, Why on Twitter, um, sometimes, I mean, you definitely refer to the stories on Who, What, Why, but sometimes refer to other stories, too. And That's true. We have a very good Twitter uh, editor or Twitter tweeter or whatever he is, and he looks at things, and he doesn't even clear it. He just has a good sense of what we're interested in, and he posts those things. Yes, sir, in the back. You mentioned uh, World Trade Center Building 7 earlier. Do you have an opinion about that? And how long well, I, I will tell you that I was standing there reporting for the Los Angeles Times, not, not a small outfit, and I was standing there and I was on the phone with my editor when the building began collapsing. And I described it to him and he was typing and I remember he said, uh, you know, holy shit, and then he said, how could that happen? And I said, it's just coming straight down like one of those right. construction things. And he said, it's got to be a controlled demolition. There's no other way. And uh, that was his reaction. So everybody was spooked. I don't know what to make of it. It, it looked to me like a controlled demolition. Um, I'm agnostic about those things. We're not afraid to say that there's more to the 9-11 story. Uh, we've done uh, stories on an angle that we developed, which was about a house in Sarasota, Florida, connected to the alleged hijackers, which is a direct tie-in to a prince of the royal of the Saudi royal family. We do think, uh, and I know Senator, uh, former Senator Bob Graham, former Governor Bob Graham agrees that there are indications of some kind of Saudi intelligence, maybe elements of the Saudi royal family that had some sort of, we don't know what it was, awareness of something and some connections there. Beyond that, it would be speculation. A lot of people have their own uh, thing, that there was this country, it was that country, it was that ethnic group, it was that government cabal. We don't I don't know, uh, but we're, well, I, 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 we don't have the time to go any further on that. I have to go on other questions. We, we, we don't know. We're willing to look at that. We can't devote all our resources to one bottomless pit like that, but we're certainly open to looking at it. Yes, ma'am, right here. Well, the judge is going to rule tomorrow on Bradley Manning. Do you have one of yeah. I'm sorry? Bradley Manning's going to be ruled on tomorrow. Do you want to? Take a guess on what that... A uh, question was, do I want to speculate what will happen to Bradley Manning? I don't do that because the people on those shows who do uh, prognosticate are almost always wrong and they never lose their jobs and I would lose my job if I was wrong, so I'm not going to. Uh, let's see, in the back there. Hi, my name is Mark Nabisky. I'm a national security whistleblower associated with illegal government, yeah. domestic surveillance, and private contracts. I'm also a, a financial uh, government... Okay, question, control. because we don't... Control. No, I, I want to give you some credit, because I'm not going to be agnostic. Mike Hastings was murdered. How many people here know who Gary Webb is? Raise your hand. How many people know who Danny Casalero is? Raise your hand. How many people know who Aaron Swartz is? Yeah. Those are all journalists that okay. were murdered, yeah. people. Yeah. Well, we stand by and watch Anthony Weiner as news. Yeah. My acronym for media is making everyone dumber in America. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Uh, sir, right, right here. Uh, I'd like to ask you, do you think we still have a constitution if we don't have habeas corpus? You know, Boston bombing, do you know what happened there? They did not read him his rights. And he, they didn't tell him that he had to have a lawyer present. And the reason, the media covered this, they said, well, they said that there's this notion that if the bomb is ticking that you can suspend that. Now, do you know what happened later? We found out that they knew there was no bomb. That's scary, okay? So what they're doing, that and the lockdown that took place in that city and the lack of habeas corpus in Guantanamo and not just in Guantanamo, I think it's been a long time since we had a constitution. Well, my feeling... Okay, I gotta go on to take more questions. Okay, uh, sir in the back there. Speaking of the Boston bombing, 
What were they after in the Kennedy library, which obviously the Soviet Union was the version to get at the Kennedy's 50th anniversary? Okay, the question was about Kennedy's 50th anniversary. Who, what, why uh, has been writing about John F. Kennedy? Uh, and, and that is one of the great unfinished journalistic stories. Uh, I hope you'll pick up a copy of Who, What, Why. It's not just about the Bushes. I have five chapters in there of almost all new information on the assassination of John F. Kennedy. And if you want to know what that has to do with the Bush family, read the book. Uh, there's a lot of... There's a lot of history, a lot of strange things. As he says, there was a fire at the Kennedy Library the same day when everybody was distracted by the uh, Boston bombing. We don't know what happened, but apparently a lot of records may have been destroyed there. These are very interesting things. And as you probably know, the Obama administration refuses to release 50,000 documents related to an assassination that they say was done by a lone nut. And then you have to say, well, what are you holding back and, and why? Let's take two or three more questions and, uh, uh, and then, uh, yes, ma'am, wait in the back. Yes, yes. What's the most interesting tip you've had on your anonymous tip on your website? What's the most interesting tip on the anonymous web uh, tip center? There? You know, um, it's amazing. We get so many shocking things. And just since I've been here the last couple of days running around, you sit down with people and they tell you, a man this morning, a man yesterday, they tell you stories about people uh, they spoke to who told them they had some information and the next day they went walking in the woods and were never seen again or they were dead. Uh, there is a lot of scary things going on and it, none of it's investigated. None of it. And we live in a country where we all watch all those shows about, you know, what is it called, 24 or 48 and, you know, all this stuff. And we all kind of get all excited about seeing these, you know, these scary things because it's entertainment. But it's not entertainment. This stuff is real. And the same people in this country who will tell you that they think it's okay to go into a place like Chile and remove a democratically elected regime by violence, you have to wonder, what is their... Think, thinking about where the stakes are higher right here in this country. So we get a lot of scary and a lot of weird and a lot of fascinating tips uh, again and we need more staff to be able to handle them all. We, we can't even look into them. Let's take a couple more questions. Who has not asked a question? Yes, ma'am. Yeah, have you ever investigated the State Department's role in um, their connections to the, some pro-democracy movements like in Iran and Syria and the spokespeople they have here? The State Department's uh, democracy things. Uh, Carrie, can you get some pictures also just so we, just for posterity's purposes and again for the NSA? Um, I, I, uh, 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 my thought is this. All of these things are a script. When they tell us that we are going into these countries. Now, I want, I want you to understand something. I know a lot of people who work in the government, and they're good people. And they actually do have the right intention. This is important to know. There are people in the State Department. There are people in the military. There are people in all these things, USAID, who really want to help people. There are people in all these kinds of places who want to do it. And that's what they were told, you see. And when I meet them and I start telling them this stuff, they get really uncomfortable because they, they're devoted their whole life to trying to do good. And they do some good. The problem is they do some good, uh, but the larger picture is not the same thing and and that's really where, where the problem is that that let's do those things but let's really do them for the right reason um, yes sir like many people in this room we have to get our, our um, news from other sources uh, I get mine from counterpunch and a few people like that we've got lots of news coming up we're overloaded with news when we look for it I think I'm speaking for a lot of people when I say what we need is a way to mobilize we need to be able to put this together and do something like uh, that other, uh, what, what was the dot-com thing called? It was attempting to mobilize and occupy. Right. How is your magazine going to help okay. us mobilize? So the question was, that we get a lot of information, how can we mobilize? I beg to differ a little bit. I, first of all, I think that people always say to me, well, what are your solutions? You're telling us what the problems are. No, no. Getting information to enough people is the solution, and 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 it's. I don't know that it's purely just mobilizing. Literally, look, think about your own life. Okay, when you're at home and you suddenly hear a noise late at night, do you stay in bed or do you take action? Do you go to investigate and find out what's going on? And you do something. If if you see that there's a leak in your house, there's a flood, you go to find out what's causing it, and then you call somebody to do something about it. The point of the matter is that it, it literally on almost any of these things, if enough people care in any community, be it a local community or a national community, and they get mad and they and they go do 
something. There are or plenty of organizations that are there to mobilize people. There are plenty of organizations out there that have solutions on climate change, on all of these things. Not enough people care and not enough people do anything. I would argue that it's literally getting the pure information. And so just that because you read the right stuff is not enough. You need to get that information out to other people. That's where the mobile, it should be a, it should be an information and a truth mobilization. And I will tell you this, he mentioned a publication. I like it in some respects, but most of those so-called liberal publications, they never write about the Kennedy assassination. They have a policy. The, a, a magazine I used to write, which begins with N and ends with N, I used to write for them. They won't ever, they say the Warren Commission is the final word on it. The, the liberal left establishment won't cover any of the deeper politics subjects that we're talking about here. So I think you want to take a second look at what your sources are and ask real, if there really are that many good ones. Now, have you have answer, asked a question yet? Yeah. No, no, no. Who hasn't asked a question yet? Ma'am. Um, Jim, did you ever hear of Jim Douglas's book about John I know Jim. Um, the, um, no, I can't think Why he died and why it matters. Question? Yeah. I know the book, yeah. Okay. Yeah, okay. All right, one more question. Uh, Ma'am. What's your take on Yeah, um, you know, we've written a little bit about that. That's a complicated technical issue. Um, we don't, you know, one of the things we don't do, and which is I think why we have readers of all different kinds from across the spectrum, is we don't, we try not to kind of editorialize or endorse anything. We're really about the value, as I said, of telling you, hey, there's a, there's a thief in your house. There really is, you know, and, and one of the problems in this country, and I'll, I'll close with this, is that, is that there may have been a time in this country where we would not, we would argue over what we thought was the right thing to do, but we wouldn't argue over the basic facts. We're at a point now where the husband and wife are arguing about whether, you know, whether they heard a noise or not, and therefore whether there's going to be any move to get out of bed. And this is a real problem. Who Want Why sees its mission as creating a base of reliable information delivered in a kind of a entertaining, somewhat edgy way that's interesting and compelling uh, that, that gives Americans and eventually people in the world a shared set of facts so we're not arguing over the most basic uh, things because if, if we cannot agree that we're actually in a room here and some people say well, we're not in a room, you just think we're in a room, I mean we, we certainly can't move forward.